you are in forest, sometime you're in rangeland. And, and even though we don't have rangelands here, because it's such a significant percentage um, of our land in the United States, and especially of our public land in the West, I, I, I felt it's worthwhile to, to, take, to take one lecture to devote to it. Okay, so a little bit about range. Um, well, a plant community dominated by grasses, forbs, and shrubs is a pretty broad definition. We can think of, we, you could almost argue that, well, isn't that a grassland? Um, grasslands usually are not shrub dominated, so you could argue that rangelands include grasslands. Well, we have grasslands, savanna in the eastern United States. You could argue that we kind of have rangelands here, but for whatever reason, we think of, of the western grasslands as rangelands and, and not the eastern. Okay. It's about a third of the land area um, in the U.S. It's, it's over half of uh, the western land area in the United States. About two, -third, two thirds of it is, is in the private sector, and a third of it is public land, which is a little bit, uh, a lot. And that, that, that public land is mostly Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And a um, little bit of the National Park Service, but, but uh, uh, the BLM and the Forest Service are managed uh, under the authority of the Multiple Use and Sustained Yield Act, which means they are required to allow uh, whatever resources can be sustainably used to be used. And that includes grazing and mining, right? Uh, so, so rangelands are, are public land. Rangelands in the West are, are used for those. Globally, it's about half of the land area in the United States. So, so it's big. There's a lot. Here they are in the United States, uh, broken into several different categories. Um, this dark green here is a tall grass prairie, and if you look, that tall grass prairie once upon a time came pretty close to Tennessee. And that tall grass prairie is kind of within the range of the greater prairie chicken, uh, which we think we might have once had in, in Tennessee. Uh, we get in the transitional prairie, the short grass prairie over here. All this purple is a sagebrush uh, dominated prairie. In the, what would you consider this area of the United States right here? Great Basin. Yeah, that's right, that's right, the Great Basin, yeah. So you've got the Rocky Mountain Cordillera here, right? And the Cascade and Sierra Nevada Mountains here that kind of make that uh, uh, an, an, an inland basin called, called the Great Basin. And then you get into various chaparral and, and, and desert range like this, uh, down here in the south. In the world, you see they're, they're extensive. Um, uh, we certainly have our share in the United States, but like I said, 50% of the, of the terrestrial land of the, of the world could be considered range land. So, so there's, there's a lot of it. Here in the United States, uh, when it comes to managing range, range lands, there's three main things we think of. There's a lot of things we think of, but three big ones. Um, one is, is that we're, we have historically managed our range lands for livestock grazing. That's the resource we saw those, those lands were valuable for, not timber. Uh, sometimes, so, sometimes mining or, or fossil fuel development, more recently fossil fuel development, but especially livestock. Um, water, because a lot of our rangelands are in the, the relatively arid west, water is, is a limiting factor for wildlife a lot of the time, as well as for livestock. So, so um, focusing on managing rangelands around where is available water, and, or if there is none, how do we make water available, is a big part of rangeland management. And then the third is, is, is fire. What do livestock and fire have in common here? Here, specifically? No, in, 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 in rangelands, in rangeland management. They both destroy the, the grass. <laughs> What's the word I'm looking for? You're close. Um, Starts with a D. It does disturb, disturb. Yeah. They're disturbance factors, yeah, yeah. Um, so livestock, is that a, considered a natural disturbance factor? Not cows. No. Uh, and if it's not a natural disturbance factor, it is a what? Introduced. 
but uh, uh, in, uh, caused by humans. We call that what? Working on, working on your terminology, your, your vocabulary. Yeah. Yeah, it starts with an A. Abiotic? Mm -hmm. uh, anthropogenic. Anthropogenic. Gabby, Gabby for the score. Yeah. So an anthropogenic disturbance factor. Fire uh, was happening uh, uh, all along, right? So that was a natural disturbance factor. Before there was livestock grazing, was there any natural grazing going on? Of course, right? Bison and, and uh, uh, primarily bison, but, but also you know the other ungulates as well. So um, it's it's variable how important those disturbance factors have been and are in maintaining those those systems, but. It's, it's universal that uh, the intensity of those factors absolutely impacts them. So we pay real close attention to uh, how much you allow grazing and how much you allow fire. We have historically you know, thought sim simplistically like, um, let's get rid of the bison, put in cattle, get rid of the fire so more grass can grow so we can grow more cattle. Uh, and that's very artificial, simplistic thinking that is, is badly detrimented our rangelands. Um, my first class at Oregon State University was fire ecology. And I, I just moved out there two days before. I was fresh from UT Knoxville. Um, and I went into this room with a bunch of graduate students who seemed to know each other and I didn't know anybody yet. And some guy came into the front of the room, a couple of years older than me, he looked like he was about 26. He had hair halfway down his back and a blue jean jacket. And he said, hey, I'm Dr. Kaufman's TA. I'm here to just hand out some, some syllabi and stuff for you guys for the first day. And everybody started laughing. I learned that this was Dr. Kaufman. And uh, uh, he was a fire ecologist in the Department of Rangeland Management. And while I was there, he went up for tenure and there was a big controversy because his department didn't want to give him tenure because they didn't like him. They didn't like the, what his research was saying. And was what his research was saying was that range, the traditional rangeland, Department of Rangeland Resources was advocating for livestock grazing practices that were unsustainable. This research says, what my colleagues say you should do isn't, it, it's not sustainable. We can't do that. We've got to reintroduce fire and we've got to ease back on grazing. And they hated that. <laughs> but they couldn't deny him tenure because his research was sound. Uh, and his research was, was all documented. And, and so rather than you know, kick him out, which they couldn't do, they gave him to the Department of <laughs> Wildlife and Fisheries. We gladly took it. <laughs> But uh, that, that, to me, that was very telling, that, that that's kind of um, a commentary on the history of rangeland management in the United States, is the traditional rangeland managers are very closely associated with livestock management, uh, and, and um, the transition from traditional livestock management on the ranges to contemporary rangeland sustainable management has been a little bumpy. Still working on that. Um, <coughs> who's heard of the Sagebrush Rebellion? Anybody? This is before your time, before before most of you guys were, were born. Uh, historically, um, public land allowed grazing by use of grazing fees. So ranchers would pay the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, um, so many dollars per animal unit month, and I'll talk about animal unit months in a bit. And if on private lands, uh, back in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and early 2000s, if on private lands, uh, uh, grazing fees were like six bucks an AUM, uh, on public lands, often Forest Service and BLM land, 
uh, grazing fees would often be about a third of that, about $2 per AUM. And so ranchers didn't complain too much about, about public lands because they could graze for a whole lot cheaper uh, on public land than they could on adjacent private lands without having to buy the land themselves, right? So that was okay. Um, but as, as um, folks with concerns against grazing have shown a light on that, uh, that practice of, of below market value grazing fees, it's what we call a hidden subsidy, We're kind of subsidizing the livestock industry by letting them graze for cheap prices. Um, that's, that's forced the value of you know, the cost of, of grazing fees on public lands to go up, and neighboring ranchers don't like it. So there have been, in the 1970s and early 80s, they called it the Sagebrush Rebellion. Ranchers saying, we no longer think that the, the government is doing right by buying more and, and, and maintaining public land. That land should be our land. The federal government should sell it. Uh, and, and let us buy it and do what we want with it because they're not managing it properly. Um, and, and that continues today. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's become highly politicized. And so even like in Tennessee, if a National Wildlife Refuge wants to, to potentially explore purchasing more land to add to a National Wildlife Refuge here in Tennessee, uh, a lot of people in the agricultural community will say no, no more public land, no more public land. That should all be for agriculture. Um, so just as the ranchers uh, uh, and the public land, the private land advocates are, are, are screaming that we need to divest the public land, environmentalists uh, and, and some ecologists are screaming that we need to divest of, of livestock, or at least some of it. So um, has, anybody, uh, has anybody heard of or read any stuff by Edward Abbey? You might enjoy that, uh, Gary. Edward Abbey uh, was an American writer. He died several years ago, but he was an American writer that was, um, uh, uh, let's see, how would I describe Edward Abbey? Um, a very well-respected and awarded uh, American writer. He wrote about um, uh, a few things, but including the American West. Um, he wrote a, um, one book called Desert Solitaire, about his experiences as a park ranger uh, with the National Park Service in the West. And he wrote a fiction book. Okay, let's let be clear, this guy's considered a fringe liberal by, by a lot of folks. He wrote a fiction book called um, The Monkey Wrench Gang. Has anybody heard of that? It was about a bunch of social malcontents who didn't really like urban development out West. So they kind of found each other and went around doing things like burning down billboards and uh, pulling up surveying stakes and pouring sugar in the gas tanks of bulldozers where they were putting in developments and, and committing minor acts of, of eco-sabotage, right? Um, but they had, the, the guy in charge was this crazy guy named George Hayduke who had a vision to um, blow up the Hoover Dam. Um, but uh, from that book, that book inspired the formation of the group Earth First, who you heard of. Now those guys are considered eco-terrorists. These are the guys who spike trees and, and you know, really cause endangerment to life. And, and uh, some people say, you know, yeah, Abby was, was you know, an eco-terrorist, shame on him. And, and Abby said, no, I never wanted to endanger life. And Earth First, I, I appreciate your, your spirit and your thoughts, but I think you might have slightly misconstrued my intent, my book was somewhat symbolic. But, but uh, anyway, um, uh, that, that culture, often called the, the BLM, the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, to suggest that um, public rangelands in the West were managed, they were in the pocket of the livestock industry and the mining industry. And that's kind of slowly been changing. So we have this change, this shifting paradigm, where historical rangeland and wildlife management was, was largely about balancing livestock management with big game. We want there to be enough, enough forage left for the elk and whatever other mule deer and, and other species we want. But today, uh, we're recognizing that you know, big game is important, but biodiversity is important too. 
There's a lot of endangered species in the western rangelands, such as the sage grouse, the willow flycatcher, the desert tortoise, the great gray owl, and many others. And managing for those species is a little bit more complex than, than balancing between cattle and elk. Good? Three big misunderstandings about managing rangelands, managing those grasses. One is that livestock have just simply replaced bison and native ungulates. Uh, those, those, those ungulates were, were natural disturbance factors, and cattle are doing the same thing. How is it different? What's that? They're not native. They're not supposed to be there, and they, they're way more than them. Okay. So, so for, for well, they're they're not native. Okay. They're different Maybe in their habits. More. Maybe not. What's that? They're different in their habits. Bison, they have a tendency to roll around in the ground, and it leaves nutrient patches for different plants or other animals to use. Okay. While Cows typically don't. Right, so you have bison wallace, so they're different in their behavior and in, and in how they graze, and even among, even among different species of livestock, there are differences between cattle, horses, sheep, etc. Um, what's another difference with regard to how they're managed? Cows tend to be big. Managed to be big. Yeah, those, yeah, those just eat everything and then we'll just rotate them somewhere else, but. Wait, what? You, so you like cows, you just have them in a field, you eat a bunch of grass, and then once all that grass is gone, you just rotate them to a different field. Okay, so so how do you keep them in one field in the first place? Fence rows, fence rows, cowboys. Fencing, yeah. fencing. Yeah. Right. right, yeah, and yeah, yeah, herding, fencing. And did we have that with bison? No. 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 So they, 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 they moved over vast distances, right? Uh, and, and that's that's probably the most significant difference is, is that livestock we don't move them we just we just plop them down and we do some rotation but in those massive western rangelands not very much and, and got to understand it, it's here here in the in the in the southeastern United States we can talk about how many cows an acre of land can support in the western United States we talk about how many acres. <laughs> Uh, it takes to support one cow, literally. Um, and so when you hear about massive ranches, it's not always that they have so many more head of livestock that we do in the east. They just need that much more land uh, because the area is much more arid and it just can't produce as much grass to feed as many cows. So uh, yeah, livestock have not just replaced native ungulates, they're, they're managed differently. They're held on land uh, and the land's not given an opportunity to recover. The, the way usually it was. The historical rule of thumb used to be very simply um, uh, take half, leave half. Uh, uh, that's, there's beauty and simplicity. Uh, it, it seems fair. You know, we'll, we'll take half for humanity, for cattle, and the other half for all the other wildlife. But why is, what's the flaw there? Half just for wildlife may not cover all the needs. Okay, what else? How do you measure half? Usually the half taken has got the better resources. Yeah. If we're measuring it in terms of biomass or height or something like that, they're taking the best stuff first, right? And if it's best for cattle, it's best for everything else too probably. Yeah? Yeah. So there's quantity and there's quality. And, and that, that idea of half is a very simplistic thing. Right? And the third, overgrazing can be detected by observing vegetation height. But again, that they're not necessarily just just starting at the top and grazing everything down um, across the board, they're taking the good stuff, they're cherry picking, like, like we all would. So concerns, uh, these are common concerns in, in managing rangelands, um, uh, is, is riparian rangelands where we have water, those are especially sensitive, they're, they're especially rich, they're um, easily impacted, um, water is scarce, so they're going to be in high demand. 
and therefore they could easily be, be degraded. Um, montane is, it refers to mountainous. So montane meadows or mountain meadows, uh, often uh, near alpine levels, high in the mountains where we have uh, riparian zones, uh, those meadows can be very delicate. When we moved mountain goats from the Rocky Mountains to um, well, uh, the mountains of, of Western Washington State. Uh, oh, yeah, what's that? Cascade. No, no Western. Oh, Western. But, you know, the, yeah, not the Coast Range, but the. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not come back later. <laughs> um, uh, to, to those mountains in, in, north, in northwestern Washington State, uh, those mountain, those montane meadows were not adapted to to, uh, to mountain goats, and um, uh, it was not the same species of vegetation, uh, and, and they could not withstand that that grazing. Even though what we thought it was native species, that was native to North America, not to not to those mountains. Um, sagebrush steppe. Uh, which is large, flat, unforested grasslands uh, have been heavily impacted. This is um, what a lot of the central basin looks like. Uh, and, and this is home to the sage grouse. And sage grouse are called sage grouse because they live in um, uh, these sagebrush ecosystems. And in the winter, when there's nothing else to eat, they eat sagebrush. It's very low quality food, but there's a whole lot of it. And they get by. They don't get by well, but they get by. And in the summer, they eat everything that gets them back into good shape again, <laughs> like a lot of grouse do, which is all of the forbs and the invertebrates in those forbs. When we put cattle on these sagebrush habitats, what do they eat? They eat all the grasses and forbs, everything that you know that those sage grouse and, and native wildlife are, are adapted to. So we've highly degraded, overgrazed the quality of those sage of those sagebrush systems. Um, deserts, uh, you know, we, we've often thought of those as, as uh, not particularly valuable, not particularly sensitive, as arid places where there's no life, but we've learned in recent decades, oh, no, there's a tremendous amount of diversity there, and, and it is sensitive, and we have to be very careful, especially where we have water in the desert. Um, aspen, uh, uh, aspen forests, where aspens are integrated into, into grassland systems, those are very uh, rich, um, productive uh, places that can be overgrazed as well. So, like I said before, uh, in, in livestock management, um, we, we measure numbers of livestock or stocking, st stocking rate uh, as an animal unit month or an AUM. Who's familiar with that? Who's heard that before? This is new to all of you? Okay, good to know. Um, so one animal unit is a mature cow with a calf or something equivalent. So a cow and a calf unit, okay? Uh, so one animal unit month is one animal unit grazed for one month. And so uh, rangeland managers talk about, uh, you know, how many AUMs they, they're, 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 this area can, can support. How are we doing? I will put this on canvas if I go too fast for it, okay? So things we think about when it comes to managing livestock on rangelands is um, how many, uh, of course, um, how long to, to let them be on the rangeland, uh, and when to let them be on different rangelands. So when I was uh, working on my PhD in Oregon, I worked, I worked in the mountains of northeastern Oregon, the Wallawa Mountains, and um, it, was, it was right here in the northeastern corner of the state. You could see, you could see Idaho from my tent, and, and I was about, about 10 miles from Washington State, right there in the corner. And um, it was, it was, the ridgetops were, were land owned by the Wallawa Whitman National Forest, and the valley bottoms were owned by ranchers. And uh, the ranchers owned the land in the, in, the, in the bottoms, but they grazed their livestock on the National Forest. Um, so in the wintertime, 
they would bring their, their livestock down to their own properties and they would feed them hay through the, through the winter. Uh, and in the summertime, they would push them back up onto the, on, onto the public land. And uh, there were two ranchers that, that lived near me. And every now and then they would help me with my research for fun and I would help them with their ranching. And uh, so I got, they, they, they let me uh, help move the cattle up onto the, uh, back down to the winter range once at the, at the end of the summer. They, uh, they, they made me ride a mule. Um, her name was Sue, uh, and I teased my wife about that because my wife's name is Suzanne, and, and uh, she didn't like that very much. But, and that doesn't have anything to do with anything, but it was, a, it, it, it was, it was an eye-opening experience for me. But, um, so yeah, time and, and duration of grazing is, is, is an important consideration. They want to maximize the amount of grass they get. They want to minimize the impact um, let the grass have time to recover at the end of the season. Um, how they're distributed, do we let them clump up around the water or do we, do we push them out so that they're eating the other grass away from the water too? Uh, how do we deal with that? Do we need to use more fencing, which is more expensive and time consuming? Or, or, or use, use herding? Uh, or, or, or what do we do? Um, what type of livestock? Do we, do we cattle, sheep, uh, goats? Horses, different breeds of, of cattle for different places. These are all considerations. Specialized grazing systems, just continuous grazing, just, just old simple style, just let it let them go. Deferred grazing, don't let them onto some pastures until the pastures have had time to mature and animals to, to use that habitat for a bit yet. Um, rotational, rest rotational grazing, where you move them from one pasture to another. Some combination or specialized example like Flash grazing, where you only let them use use it for a little bit of time. Um, is was anybody in wildlife biopolitics when uh, when Baron Crawford talked about um, grazing management on the Charles M. Russell National Wildlife Refuge in Montana? Get a bunch of blank looks. Okay, maybe not. Um, what's that? Yeah. Class. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, I might have him back and he might talk about that. But uh, yeah, the Charles M. Russell is the largest uh, national wildlife refuge in the lower 48 states um, here in, in Montana. It's, 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 it's huge. And um, it was originally um, uh, created kind of in the early days of the national wildlife refuge system to be jointly managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And, and as a Fish and Wildlife Service uh, refuge, its original goal was to manage for a, like a very high number of sharp-tailed grouse. Uh, and, and, the, and it was eventually given over completely to the, Nat the Fish and Wildlife Service. And, and the grazing contracts that had been awarded to local ranchers for decades and decades, the ranchers just expected to be able to continue to graze. But once it was handed over to the Fish and Wildlife Service, they said, no, you, we're not meeting our, our objectives of, of providing habitat for this many sharp-tailed grouse. So we're going to lower grazing. And over the course of, of a decade or two, they lowered the amount of, of animal unit months of grazing contracts dramatically. And the number of sharp-tailed grouse increased uh, dramatically you know, as, the, as the habitat recovered. And it, it, was, it was dramatic. So a lot of the time when you're looking for, you know, some compromise between still allowing livestock and, and allowing for wildlife too, um, it calls for clear communication between the range man rangeland managers uh, and between the wildlife biologists who might or might not know exactly the same language. So for example, the biologist might say, we need, um, in order to manage for my species, for my sharp-tailed grouse, or my mule deer, or my burrowing owl, or whatever, I need X percent cover, X plant species composition, X vegetation structural conditions, whatever that you know from your research. And the rangeland manager says, okay, um, we can do grazing this many animal unit months this time of the year with this species of livestock and, 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 and maximize our livestock grazing and still meet your conditions, right? So 
We just have to know exactly what we need. It's not, it's no longer good enough to say, we need to get those cattle off of there. Or we don't need as many cattle. They're like, well, how many's, how many's too many? <laughs> you know? and, and, it, and it's fair enough for the rangeland managers to say, I don't trust you when you say that. I don't trust that you know what you're talking about. But if you say, the species that I'm managing for needs 60% cover. We need, we need to have 40% uh, of this, uh, this species available uh, of plant. We need these structural conditions. Okay, we can do that, we can do that. Does that make sense? The best management is adaptive management. It's got, it's got research incorporated into it that allows us to come up with these compromises. We've come a long way with fencing too. Um, we can use fencing to include livestock, or sorry, to exclude livestock, but uh, research has showed us that uh, uh, a fence that's got two strands of barbed wire above a clean strand of wire uh, uh, is easy for pronghorn to pass through. Uh, that has the same thing, but is, is um, uh, fortified in the, in the middle, so there's no not flexibility in the middle. Mule deer do just fine there. Uh, uh, move those top two pieces of barbed wire closer together, uh, and, and mountain sheep do just do just fine there. Um, alternatively, uh, you can you can do other fencing arrangements that keep livestock in and that keep wildlife out if that's what you want to do. Uh, and we can use different types of, of, of fencing for for different purposes. And, and um, uh, it's it's a uh, it's an eye-opener to see the variety of fencing that's used in specialized ways. My study area in Oregon, um, I don't have photos to show you, but imagine rocky, arid, ridge, long ridge tops that would go out for a few miles. Uh, and, and, and on these, these rocky talus slopes, um, every few hundred yards, there would be a spring burbling up out of the ground on, on, the, on the side of the ridge. Uh, and th in that spring, there would be um, grasses and forbs, a fair bit of, of, of nice vegetation around it. And a lot of those springs, the Forest Service had, had fenced livestock out in an area maybe the size of this room so that wildlife could, could jump in and, and could use that water, but livestock couldn't. And on the downhill side, uh, there would be a, a catch basin and, and, and a trough uh, so, that, so that water was available for the livestock. Fire, mechanical treatments, herbicides are all ways that we have uh, uh, tried to, to, to manage rangelands. Just as in the east we fight um, invasive exotics, so do they in the west. Salt cedar, has anybody heard of salt cedar or tamarisk? Uh, it's a, in the southwest in Texas, in the, the southwest it's a, it's a common invasive plant on our rangelands. Um, in, the Great Basin, western juniper has encroached on the sagebrush ecosystems. So um, natural historic fire return intervals in those sagebrush systems was, was every few years, I don't remember, two to f no, maybe every four years or so. And when those western junipers, related to our eastern red cedar, when those western junipers were very young, um, uh, fires would kill them. So not many junipers would survive, but smoking the bears, they put the fires out, we put the fires out, these things have gotten big enough so that when the fires come down, they withstand the fire. So millions of acres uh, of what was uh, sagebrush and with grasses and forbs in the summer have been overtaken by these junipers, which shade out the grasses and forbs and have just destroyed grazing for, for livestock as well as live, wildlife um, has been a real problem because I mean, you're having to go and cut these trees with chainsaws and it's, it's crazy expensive. Um, so that's, that's been a real issue. So fire, fire, fire. And then developing the water uh, resources is, is, a huge, is a huge part of, of what they do on range things. Um, it's there for wildlife. I mean, wildlife's there. Uh, it's always been there. Um, but, but uh, we might have to protect it so that it'll continue to be there for wildlife. And if we protect it, we might even decrease 
They carry capacity for some species of wildlife. So there's springs, like I talked about. There's horizontal wells. There's, in the southwest, Tanahas, natural rock tanks. We can create concrete dams on bedrock and washes called sand dams. Uh, we create reservoirs and small ponds, just like we do here. Uh, dugouts or charcos, large earthen catchment basins. Adits, which are blasted uh, uh, tunnels down into the bedrock. Um, uh, what we, we often, what we used to call gallinaceous guzzlers, and that's a term you might still hear, hear every now and then, which I, I think is kind of a funny term. Um, gallinaceous refers to gallinaceous game birds, chicken-like game birds. So the grouse uh, and turkeys and, and quail uh, would, would, would come to these uh, man-made man or man-human-maintained water developments. Um, we, we now call them wildlife water developments or WWDs. But, but, uh, so there's all sorts, all sorts of styles. You can, if, if you Google up gallinaceous guzzler or wildlife water development, you'll see a, a wide variety of how these things are made and maintained in the West. But a lot of the time they're shaded. Uh, they might have some sort of a structure to prohibit or limit livestock from getting in there. A lot of the time, the vegetation is planted around, and they're getting ready to plant vegetation here. Uh, and and uh, uh, some are big and some are small. Something that's becoming more and more uh, of, of an issue in, in recent years on rangelands is is methane. Um, we we joke about. Uh, Cow farts, or what they really call cow burps, uh, you, know, and, you know. How much really does that does, does that does that matter? Uh, in 2017, um, uh, Western public land methane production uh, came, uh, or not Western U.S. public land methane production. No, not public land. U.S. methane production came 16% from oil and gas extraction, 21% from landfills. 26% from manure, and 28% from enteric fermentation. Calibers. You're right. Crazy, right? Uh, so, um, you know, we can make the argument that, well, before there was cows burping, there were bison burping, uh, and there's actually been a tremendous amount of research on how much does, does that really matter. Uh, methane is, is not as common uh, as a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide, but it's way more powerful. Um, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's a problem. So it's gonna be one of the considerations, one of many considerations about future public land, uh, rangeland management is, is if we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, is reducing livestock grazing rates gonna be a piece of that puzzle? And it might be not only for greenhouse gas emissions, but also for uh, you know al allowing for biodiversity as well. So it's a consideration. Questions? Garrett, do you work on rangelands? No, nope, I work in the desert. Well, that could be considered rangeland. Yeah, yeah, I guess okay. I I worked on it was a marine area where they like do training and stuff, but um, yeah, they like contract with Arizona DNR. Very good. Very good. Okay. And I met I met a guy who went to Arizona State. His entire major was rangeland management. Yeah. yeah. It's it's the common major in the western states. Yeah. What species did you work with out there? I worked with his main I mainly worked with like reptiles, so like lizards and snakes, so yeah. maybe birds and then We'd see, we see a kangaroo mouse every every once in a while. Very cool. Yeah. Geckos, scorpions, tarantulas. Nice. Cool. Okay. Well, like I say, we don't have them around here, but uh, it, it is a, a significant chunk of our real estate in the U.S., so, so worth understanding at least some basic information about it. Fair enough? Good. Any questions? All right. Done early this time.